It's amazing. Thank you guys so much. Uh, I'm so honored to be able to serve this house and be able to serve the purposes of God in this generation. And uh, today I'm just blown away um, at just God's faithfulness over 47 years. And uh, just, just, just been thinking about uh, just the hand of God in my life since I was a child. And um, just want to thank everybody in the room, everyone who's joining us uh, in the Zoom rooms, everyone who's joining us online. Welcome home. Thank you for being a part of uh, just our church. And also thank you for being a part of this uh, incredible day um, 47 years ago when God decided to uh, do some things on the earth and decided to use me and my family and our church to do it. And so thank you for being a part of this journey. And I'm so grateful uh, that I get to serve with you all and do this together. We're, we're in this together. Come on, somebody. So you can have your seats and, and God's presence. And uh, Wow. First of all, I just want to just want to just say uh, all of you who are online watching right now, all of you who are in Zoom rooms, uh, and you're going to the grocery store, and you're going to the mall, and you're going to out to eat, and I want to encourage you to, to come back to church in the room. I want to encourage you. There's something powerful that is, is a part of this room, and yes, our team is is working hard on our, all of our safety measures by the CDC, and, uh, but I'm believing that it's it's as we move forward and as we, uh, we're not coming back to church, but we're, we're, we're gathering together as a family to take the vision to another level. And so uh, we definitely honor everyone's decision. Uh, whether if you decided to watch online, you can, can continue to do that. We're trying to make all of our experiences better. Uh, we love all the people that are in Zoom rooms. Can we just give it up for all the people that are in Zoom rooms? What's up, Zoom? I see so many familiar faces on there and, and I'm honored. I'm, I'm sober today. Uh, because it is my birthday, but I've I just been thinking about the goodness of God. I've just been thinking about the hand of God. I've just been thinking about uh, 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 what's God done in my life and, and how God is using me. And uh, I'm, I've been thinking about my family. I've been thinking about my amazing wife. Uh, I would just say this, like nothing, uh, this day wouldn't matter at all <laughs> uh, unless I get to do it with my amazing bride of 21 years. So we just keep it up for Pastor Irene and I love you so much. And, Kayla, Jaden, and Maya, uh, my niece and nephew are here, Donovan and Danielle, and I'm just so grateful for family. I'm so grateful uh, for spiritual sons and daughters. Uh, I've gotten so many texts, and y'all, I'm telling you, you know you've graduated when a spiritual son sends you money. Come on, somebody. Just let y'all know. You, you, know, you know things have happened, uh, and y'all don't get that yet. I get you, uh, but uh, I'm excited. Let me tell y'all something. Like, I, I was going to preach this message, and, I, and I'm, I'm going to preach it when God releases me to. Um, and I had planned on preaching it today, and then I woke up uh, with just a different thought today. And uh, I want to share with you uh, from my heart today, and, and uh, if we were to have dinner, if we were to have dinner one-on-one, -on -one, uh, I want you to kind of receive this message like that. Like it's just me and you talking, and me and you uh, growing and, and developing together. And, uh, you know, my, my dad has, has been such an inspiration in my life. My dad's 73 years old, and I thank God that he's, he's, uh, he's coming through COVID, um, COVID-19, and my mom is coming through COVID-19, and we're believing God uh, for my grandmother's healing uh, of COVID-19, and, and uh, so I've just been reflecting a lot on family. I've been reflecting a lot like who I am and how I got to be who I am today, and, and my dad, uh, years ago, uh, when I, I remember he sat me down, I think he turned 50, and he sat me down and he gave me this lesson, and here's what I want you to do. I would love for you to take notes today. Uh, I would love for you to lean in like we're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Like if we were to meet one-on-one, -on -one, have dinner one-on-one, -on -one, uh, this is the kind of conversation I'd love to have with you. And, and so I, I'm not really going to preach today. I'm, I, I might step in and out of preaching and teaching, but I, I really want to share with you today my heart. Um, my, but my dad told me about something called the drawer of experience. And, and he said to this, he said, make sure that your drawer is never empty. He said, everything that happens in life does not happen to you it happens for you and what it does is it gives you tools that are inside of your drawer and he called this thing that the drawer of experience and so how many of you would be uh, uh you know you can think back and, and maybe you had a junk drawer you know growing up or you got a junk drawer right now you have no idea what's in that junk drawer until you need something from that junk drawer right and then it, it's kind of funny because no matter where you like have designated areas for tools and designated areas for brushes and keys and change and 
wipes now, but come on, somebody, sand, hand sanitizer. Everything ends up in this junk drawer. But I, I've come to find out that, that God works all things together for our good, and there's nothing that he throws away in our life. And what he does is he stores everything in our junk drawer. And so today, I, I want to preach to you, talk to you, share with you from this topic, the drawer of a dreamer. The drawer of a dreamer. Father, I pray that you do something amazing today in this place. God, all those who are watching this on Zoom or online or who will watch this later on the replay, God, I pray, God, that you speak to them. God, a word, a, an encouragement, a, a prophetic declaration of their dream in their life and who you have called them to be. Father, you said in your word in Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. So, Father, I pray that you wake up the dreamer. That you wake up those who, whose dreams have fallen asleep through isolation and discouragement and delay and denial and frustration and agitation and uncertainty and fear. And, Father, as we share today, I pray, God, that they would find courage to start dreaming again. In Jesus' name. And everybody said a good amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much. Uh, having a, I just love, you know, our team, our band, our worship team, all of the, those who serve in this house. Thank you for serving the vision of this house. And uh, God, in, in 2020, uh, you know, 2020 was a rough year. And we, you know, we preached a message a few weeks ago called More Than Made It, that we just didn't make it uh, over the cross, over the finish line, or just didn't make it out of 2020 into 2021, that we more than made it. And when I go back, every time I, I, I get to a birthday, a year uh, of another uh, um, season of life, I always reflect back of what, what did God say, what, God, what did God do over the last year? And as I reflected on that this morning, as I reflected on that last night, I wanted to share with you some lessons that I have been learning and some, some tools that are in my drawer of experience, if you will, uh, over this last year from 46 to 47. And specifically in the beginning of 2020, if you remember uh, at when we had our, if those of you who were here and we had our, our watch night service or uh, we had, a, we always do like a New Year's Eve service and I preached the word uh, called focus and the word of the year was focus. And I had no idea, normally that word of the year is like, it's gonna be a great year and, and God's gonna do you know, exceedingly abundantly above that he could, we could ever all ask, think, or imagine. But last year's word was focus. How many of y'all know that it took focus to get through 2020? But specifically, the Lord gave me a specific word that was for me personally. And he took me to Acts chapter two, verse 17, and that's where I wanna start. And it says this, in the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. Well, just to give you some context of this scripture, this is Peter, and Peter has gotten up to preach this message, and Peter was the one who was always missing Jesus. He was the one who would deny Jesus three times. Peter is the one that Jesus would even call Satan and say, get behind me, Satan. Come on, somebody. And it's amazing that, uh, you know, on the verge or the, or, the, or the dawn of the first day of church, uh, Peter would get up and preach a sermon, and the sermon came out of the uh, the, the fulfillment of prophecy in Isaiah uh, that Jesus has come and now Jesus uh, uh, is, has graduated, if you will, uh, on to heaven and, and uh, he has fulfilled his assignment. And this is the release of the Holy Spirit. And they were waiting on the Holy Spirit. And in Acts 1.8, it says, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. And you all know that in the, it, it, when the Holy Spirit was released, there, there was about 120 people in a room. And they had all gathered from all nations, all tribes, and, and, and they had come to this day because it was Passover. And Passover was when they celebrated the Day of Atonement. 
Well, the day when their sins were released, and, and, and so the Bible says that there were 120 in a room, and, and suddenly there was a sound, and, and because there was unity, this, uh, the Holy Spirit descended upon this room, and there were fire, and it began to share, shake the foundations, and it says that they begin to speak in other tongues. And I'm just saying all this because this is the expression of the Holy Spirit, that when the expression of the Holy Spirit comes, it's not us, it's not for us to get a witness and have church. It actually is for us to be a witness and be the church. So Peter gets up and he, and he prophesies or he gives this first sermon and he's, he's saying that, you know, uh, uh, he's trying to, these, these, these men are not drunk as you suppose. And, and he's saying all these things because, uh, because the power of the Holy Spirit. And then he lands on this. And, and the Bible says that after Peter preaches, 3,000 people were added to the body of Christ and those that were added daily. There was multiplication. But I wanted to focus on this specific passage of scripture in verse 17. It says, your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. And I want everybody who attends our five to listen to the words that I'm saying. Everyone who's here in this room, everyone who's watching online, listen to the words that I'm saying today. Because what the Lord specifically told me in 2020, he said, Jimmy, I'm transitioning you from having vision for yourself to an old man. And I was like, no, I'm not old. <laughs> Come on, somebody. I can still jump a little bit. I can still, you know, dance, you know, from waist up. <laughs> I still like to have fun. I, I, you know, my, my muscles are moving good. My, my, my body feels good. And, and, and he said, no, no, no. I, I'm doing something spiritually inside of you. And as you approach 50, I am transitioning you from a young man that sees visions to an old man that dreams dreams. And I said, God, well, what's the difference of seeing a vision and dreaming a dream? And he says this, and my staff will tell you that this is what I live by, and this is what I want to give away to you today. He says, no, no, old men dream the dream of a young man who has a vision. And I said, what does it mean? He goes, I, 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 am, I am transitioning you, right, from... from from, from birthing vision to being a midwife of a dream. Now that's weird, right? No, it's not weird. And I realized that this is the nature of Jesus Christ. This is the characteristics of, of the body of Christ, of, that Jesus did not come to serve, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom. John 3.16 says what? For God so loved the world that he gave he served, he sacrificed, and, and, so, and so what I want you to do today is as the spiritual father of this house, and, and not just this house, but uh, as, a, as a mentor, uh, many have called me a big brother, uh, and I believe that God, uh, this apostolic anointing or mantle is on Pastor Irene and myself to not just pastor this church, but to pastor pastors. And if you only knew the conversations and the tears that I just had sitting in that seat watching some of these younger pastors who we've, God has called us to encourage and, and God has called us to come in and speak to their church. Church and God has helped us, if you will, uh, to give life to their marriages. Uh, I realize that the fulfillment of what God told me in 2020 has actually already been happening. He says, Jimmy, I'm calling you to dream dreams. And so if you have a dream, I want you to raise your hand. If you go to our church and God's got a dream in your heart, everybody should have a dream. It is Pastor Irene and I's assignment the transition from you serving the vision of this house to us serving the dream of your house. And those things are going to interact with each other, not independently, but corporately. That you don't have to leave the church or you don't have to go do your own thing in order to work out the dream that God has placed in your heart. We want to cover that dream. We want to pray for that dream. We want to give life to that dream. We want to push that dream forward. Come on, somebody. We're going to become dream. We're going to, we're going to dream your dream. And so what we want to do now is now I want you to look into the drawer that we have in our lives as dream dreamers. 
And there are some things that Irene and I have gone through and, and it's some anointings that God has given us in order to give to you. And so today, I want to give you 10 things that are in the drawer of those who are called to dream somebody's dream. And so here's the deal, like, if you were to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting, if you were to have a counseling session with us, which I'll call not a counseling session, but a coaching session, if we were to have one-on-one -on -one dinner, if we were to sit at your table, these are 10 things that I would want to say to you in your drawer of experience. Number one, and this is what I'm learning at 47. This is what 2020 has taught me. This is what I'm learning from my dad. Number one is be careful not to win at the wrong thing. Like if there's something I could tell you, I, here's what I told Irene, and, and, and I didn't really want to say this because I don't want to die. But if my life was over today, if today was my last day on earth, I would want you to get these 10 things. I'd want these 10 things said about me. And these are 10 things that I'm learning. Winning at the wrong thing is losing at the right thing. Winning at the wrong thing is losing at the right thing. In other words, it is important for you to decide and declare what your win is. Your win is not promotion. Your win is not followers on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook. Your win is not how many likes that you get. You got to define your win because if you don't define your win, you will end up winning at something that God was just causing, just giving you uh, 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 as an extra in your life. And I don't want to win in an extra and lose at the main thing. I don't want to win at an appetite and lose at the main course. And so what, I, what you can learn from me is for years, I, I wanted the wrong thing. I got a chance to travel. I got a chance to speak. I got a chance to travel the world. And, and man, I liked it. I loved the attention. And, and I loved it. But, you know, uh, what happens was I was so concentrating on winning on stage, I started losing at home. And many of you know our story. We just celebrated five years of sobriety of Irene, and I, and I look back at a picture a, a few weeks ago uh, of me in 2017 at 420 pounds. And I said to myself, that is a picture of somebody who was winning at the wrong thing. You see, the weight that I had was not physical weight, although it was. It was emotional weight. It was a heavy burden that comes when you're carrying something that you're not supposed to carry. And not only have I lost 150 pounds, I feel like I've gained 150 years because I'm no longer striving to win at the wrong thing. So the question that I want to ask you is, is what is your emotional scoreboard? And I wrote this down. It will be difficult to get a well done in heaven from my heavenly father if I don't get a well done at home from my wife and my kids. <laughs> and so what I'm saying is, is my number one win is my family. Now remember, you're called to dream somebody else's dream. And I remember my dad telling me years ago, when I was selfish, I think I was around 35, and, and he said this, he said, never make a decision for yourself that derails the purpose and destiny of your family. Destiny is not selfish. It's selfless. And so what I've learned and what I'm learning, especially to all my young married people, I want you to understand there's no promotion at work. There's no promotion financially that will give you the security that family will give you. Number one, winning at the wrong thing is losing at the right thing. Number two, 
Remember the second thing? I'm giving you things from the joy of experience. Live an open-handed life, and God will keep your hands full. Many of us, what we do is we clench. The first thing that happens is when God gives us something is we clench and we, gri- we grab it and, we, and we, we say it's ours and it's mine, but we forget that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. In other words, everything that comes to me is not for me. And it wasn't from me. I didn't produce it. The gifts, the talents, the skills, the abilities that you have did not come from your resume, did not come from, you know, uh, uh, school, did not come, uh, uh. it came from God. You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. And so how dare us clinch on to something that doesn't belong to us. I remember giving my kids this lesson when we were young parents and, you know, Irene and I, uh, my son loves Skittles. And to this day, he's a candy addict. Come on, somebody. And that, how many of y'all know that Skittles will set you off? Come on. And I remember being at a track meet when we started I-5 Elite, and, and we gave Jaden these Skittles. And, and then I looked at him, and I was like, Jay, um, I like Skittles, too. Can I, can I have Skittles? And he was like, no. They're mine. And he started just eating them real fast. And then he did something that I would have done when I was a, he, he spit on him. He was like, <laughs> like, you won't want them now. They're mine. And I said, no, what you don't understand is not only did I give you those Skittles, but I'm not scared to even eat them after you spit on them because in that spit is my DNA. In other words, there is no spit without me. I created you. You are my seed. So everything that you have, I was the one that produced it. So don't cling on. And what he didn't know is I had a Nintendo DS back in the day that I was going to give him that day. But I realized that when we hold on to things that we think is ours and doesn't come from God, we're also holding back the blessing and the next blessing that God has for us. God is calling us to live an open-handed life. And what I'm learning and what I learned in 2020 is is I'm going to be known for what I give away, not what I keep. I'm going to be known for what I give away, not what I keep. And many of you might say, well, what Pastor Jimmy's not really preaching today. If you, I, there's never been a more important sermon than the one I'm giving right now. That's what I felt this morning. Proverbs 11:24. And 26 says, generosity brings prosperity. This is the Passion Translation. But withholding from charity brings poverty. Those who live to bless others will have blessings heaped upon them. And the one who pours out his life to pour out blessings will be saturated with favor. Favor is not something that you can earn. It's something that God gives for an assignment. You see, blessing is free, but favor will cost you because it's for your purpose. It's for the purposes of others. It's for you to walk out this life of the Great Commission and save and seek those who are lost. Number three, what I'm learning in my joy, in my drawer of of dreaming is this, is forgiveness is not a choice. Well, let me say this. Forgiveness is a choice. Sorry. Reconciliation is a process. Forgiveness is a choice. Reconciliation is a process. And what I'm coming to learn is many of us don't forgive people because we think it means that we have to reconcile with them immediately. But let me tell you something. Many of us are holding back the blessings in our lives and and receiving forgiveness in our own lives because we are holding back forgiveness because we think that that means that I have to reconcile. Reconciliation is a process. Forgiveness is a choice. I dare you even right now just to say, man, I forgive that person because what happens is they're not in jail. Your mind is. Your sleep is. Your emotions are. 
It's keeping you up at night. That person ain't thinking about you. That person's dead and gone in the grave. And you should have made a choice at their funeral. I wrote this down and I want to say this in number three. Forgive fast. Heal slow. Ah. And, and then I wrote this down and this is on Instagram. I put the whole sermon. There's freedom and forgiveness and blessings and boundaries. Somebody say that. There's freedom and forgiveness and blessings and boundaries. Just because you forgive someone doesn't mean that you don't have to, you have to just do life with them and, and you've got to, you know, act like and tiptoe to the tools. No, no, no. Now you can create a boundary that says, I, I, my friend Norman Wallace used to say this, hurt me once, shame on you. Hurt me twice, shame on me. In other words, I don't have boundaries. Trust doesn't mean you don't learn from what happened. I can trust you, but have boundaries to protect my heart. Number one, be careful not to win at the wrong thing. Number two, live an open-handed life and God will keep your hands full. Number three, forgiveness is a choice. Reconciliation is a process. Guys, I learned this in 2020. Man, that the faster I forgive, the easier I go to sleep at night. The faster I forgive, the less emotional turmoil I feel on the inside. The faster I accept forgiveness in my own life, watch this now, the better I release anxiety in my life. Man, forgiveness is a choice. Reconciliation is a process. Number four, it is impossible to achieve authenticity without living transparently. It is impossible to achieve authenticity without living transparently. What I have been told about Pastor Irene and myself is you guys are the most transparent people. How in the world do you tell people all of that? And I've just decided this, that the enemy tried me, tested me, sent so much turmoil for so long in my life in secret. That I've just, I said secret and Siri said, uh-huh, I'm not talking to you, Siri. <laughs> that I've decided just to go public yeah. with the blessings, yeah. with the freedom, yeah. with the, the lack of emotional weight that I have right now. And I've just decided that being transparent is better. Pastor, why are you saying that? Because what I've learned, especially in 2020, and, and trust me, Pastor Irene and I are getting uh, emails and texts and DMs from so many leaders and pastors uh, around the country who, who, who are falling and making bad decisions and falling into affairs and doing the unthinkable that when they started out, I, they said that they would never do. And I said, why? And here's the deal, because you will always be as sick as your secrets. You will always be as sick as your secrets. Young people, hear me. Stop lying to your parents. Start telling the truth. Bondage. Chains, struggle, hindrance, all of those things grow in the dark, mold, mess. But when you expose it to your parents, when you expose it to God, when you expose it to the light, the, the mold dissipates. And we're so fearing getting in trouble that we're not realizing that it's not about trouble. If you only change when you get caught, it'll always take getting caught to change. I tell my son this, 
There's never going to be a time that no matter what you do and you come to me and say, Dad, I'm struggling. Dad, I'm, 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 I need help with this. You know, uh, me and Irene have this in our relationship, this, this accountability. There's never going to be a time that the first thing I do is get mad at you. No, Jaden, I don't want you to understand. I'm not mad at you. I hurt for you. For some reason, I haven't lived a transparent life enough for you to be able to come to me and feel the access that I'm a welcome mat for your mess. And we don't realize this, that being the tangible hands and feet doesn't mean just serving people. It also means loving people like God will love them when they come to the altar of your acceptance or your non-acceptance. In other words, parents, how your children view God is dependent upon your response to them when they want to take the thing that they did out of you. And they begin to trust you in that moment. I wrote this down. Transparency is what I let you see. Vulnerability is what I let you know. Accountability is what I let you hold. Intimacy is when you embrace me. And authenticity is when I have nothing to hide. I'll, I'll, I'll post that later. It is impossible to achieve authenticity without living transparently. If I could give something out of my drawer of dreaming, and I am living my dream, I would say this. There's nothing like having nothing to hide. Nothing. Pastor, do you struggle? Yes. Are you perfect? No. I just always give my wife something to hold. My wife is my greatest level of accountability. Pastor Dino Rizzo is another great level of accountability. Kevin Dotson is another great level of accountability. Wayne Francis is another great level of accountability. Wayne, what, what, Pastor, what are you saying? What I'm saying is about, I want you to be transparent with many, many vulnerable with a few. Transparent to many, vulnerable with a few. Number five. Your legacy will only be as strong as your accountability and teachability. Number five, your life and legacy will only be as strong as your accountability and teachability. What I have found is people aren't teachable. Man, I don't ever want it said about me, he thinks he knows everything. He's not teachable. He thinks he has arrived. I have not arrived. Man, I want to be teachable. I, I always want to be, I've been reading Proverbs 1 forever, just like the first three verses, about being teachable and gaining wisdom. Proverbs 13, 18 says this, poverty and disgrace come to the one who refuses to hear criticism. But the one who is easy to correct is on the path of honor. Let me tell you something. I would rather be teachable to one than disgraced to the world. Oh, y'all didn't say amen right there. Let me tell you why you didn't say amen. Because we were all born with this thing called pride that we're willing to do it on our own. And let me tell you something right now about being teachable. Let me tell you something about now about where the state of our country is right now, even in the racial tension. The problem is, is not racism. The problem is elitism. Not elitism of white people or black people, but elitism of all people that we think we know everything and what happens when you think you know everything, you will sacrifice making a difference for making a point. 
And when you're so interested in making a point, what you do is ostracize the people that God actually sent you to as a witness. Come on, Acts 1, 8, to be a witness to. Now they don't want to hear nothing from you because you know everything. And let me tell you something. When you know everything and you got all the wisdom, the kingdom of God does not come from heaven to earth. How do I know that? Because it says when you pray, our Father which art in heaven, how do it be thy name, thy kingdom come, your will, uh uh-oh, be done. And if I have all the wisdom, I'll never get his will. And let me tell you something. I'm frustrated right now. Yes, I'm frustrated at the racial disparity. Yes, I'm frustrated at the injustice. Yes, I'm frustrated at the double standards. Yes, all of that is true. But guess what's not going to change it? My post. A post has never changed anybody. All it really does is show the world what you think is right. And there is no opportunity for the will of God to come and take place because everybody knows your will. Uh Uh-huh. We don't need policy first. We need the kingdom to come from heaven to earth. I'm telling you right now, I feel called to something that will never change. And God said it will never change until you change. That's why it says in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people, not if policy who are called by my name will what? Humble themselves. Check your opinion. Check your motives. Check your heart and pray, not complain, not petition, but pray. Pray, get in the presence of God and seek my face. Then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins and heal their land. But if you think you're right, the land will never be healed because the soil ain't right. How is the soil of your heart? Number six, don't take yourself too seriously. Here's what I wrote down. Let's never suck at having fun. Man, the body of Christ is stiff. And sometimes we think because we're baptized in the Holy Spirit, right, that we can't soak ourselves in laughter. Man, learn how to laugh. Some of us are weak, not because of sin, but because we don't have joy. Because the Bible says the joy of the Lord is my strength. Tell a joke. You know, what I've, you know what I thought about this morning? My most embarrassing moment ever. My most embarrassing moment ever was years and years ago in Myrtle Beach. Y'all know those plastic chairs that you stack, you get from Kmart? You get, there's no such thing as Kmart. Target. Uh-huh. I was 420. I stuffed myself into that chair at an amusement park. It was 120 degrees. I was like a pig in a blanket in an 800 degree oven. And in front of everybody, the chair just exploded. Tell you something, this rear end has broken many a chair. And I ended up on the ground in front of everybody, real talk, and there was a parrot that talked. Like, that's a real thing. This parrot laughed at me. It's a true story, put his wing. <laughs> He put his wing, he was like embarrassed. Why am I telling you that? Because I've just decided that I, no matter where I go, no matter where I preach, no matter how serious I am, I always want to remember falling on the floor in front of everybody and laughing. Because many of us take ourselves too seriously. Let me tell you something, the result of me preaching this message today is me not taking myself too seriously. Because I could have preached the other message But I wanted to give you this one. I want you to remember your most embarrassing moment. Number seven, don't allow the crowds to get to your head or the critics to get to your heart. Don't allow the crowds to get to your head or the critics to get to your heart. Watch this now. We will only feel like we get hate from people. We will only feel like when we get hate from people is an attack on us when we make it about us and not other people. We will only feel like we get hate from people is an attack on us when we make it about us 
and not other people. I'm going to write this down. I'm going to send this out. Actually, go to my Instagram page. Our church will post this whole message on there. Here's, here's what I'm saying. Don't allow the crowd to get to your head or the critics go to your heart. See, what, what happens is when that happens, then you'll start striving. Then you'll start trying to prove yourself to people, not purpose yourself in God. If you're proving yourself to people, you will never purpose yourself to God. Remember, if tomorrow, if I'm dead and gone, these are the things, God forbid, but these are the things that I want you to remember. Number eight, be known for what you're for, not what you're against. It is impossible to have compassion if the people that need it the most feel judged because of your convictions. Your personal conviction is not meant to ostracize and to make people feel outcasted. Your personal conviction is to drive you to compassion to the thing you're convicted about. See, what we think is, is our personal conviction is the key for me to get into heaven. Your personal conviction is the key for you to bring other people to heaven with you in the thing you're convicted about. Well, Pastor, I don't agree with that lifestyle. Well, neither does God agree with yours. Well, Pastor, I don't agree with their choices. Remember what I said. It's impossible to make a difference if you're trying to make a point. I was asked the question this week. How do we change the racist? How do we reach the skinhead? I said, I don't know. I'm too mad to have compassion for their sin. Mm. Y'all was with me until then. The Bible says, the Great Commission, that Jesus came to give all authority to all people. All authority to all people, not some authority to some people. Which means if I only have tolerance for some people, I'm probably not going to operate with all of God's authority. Therefore, I won't have the great commission, I'll have the great omission. Let me tell you guys something. This church is not called to diversity. We as the body of Christ are called to diversity. And guess what? I, I, want, I want things to change. I, I hate the conversations I have to have with my son that my white friends don't have to have with theirs. But I ask myself, God, what's going to change it? And he said, first, I want you to understand that when you gave your life to Christ, and I've said this, that our ethnic culture is a subculture to the kingdom culture. And then he says this, as a disciple, I've called you to be a bridge builder And if you're, going to win, if you're going to be willing to build a bridge, you're going to have to be willing to be walked on by both sides. I want it to change. I hate it. I hate how it makes me feel. I hate being stereotyped. I hate being profiled. It happens. But what I would love is the number one profile to be is he's kingdom. The number one profile is, is he has the compassion for the things that trouble him the most. Jesus came while we were yet sinners. It says we were saved while we were yet sinners. That means somehow he had to have compassion for the thing he hated. He hates sin. So in order to die on that cross, he had to be like, I, like when he says, you know, Father, let this cup pass with me. Like some of it, that's where I'm at right now. I'm working through it. Like, Father, I don't want to put, people have been judging me, you know, you don't say enough. You know, uh, I, me? 
I let them march. Like, and then you get the, you say too much. And then you get the, the church needs to open in COVID. Y'all don't have enough faith. Then you get the other people. Why are we opening? Right? And then you get to, let's stay online. Then you get people, I hate being online. And what I've decided is I'm going to build a bridge. And I'll be right in the middle. Right? And and, and I'm going to get to, which number am I on? I'm going to skip nine. I've already said it. Be a lifetime learner. And I'm going to get to ten. What I'm going to do is not play for this side and not play for this side. You have to understand that the kingdom is neither right nor left. It is up. And if you, everybody do your hands like this. What you're doing is you're making a cross. And the tension point, if you're building a cross with nails and wood, is right in the middle. Because in order to go this way, you first have to have stability this way. And the tension right in the middle of your cross right now was your heart. And I've decided I'm going to play for an audience of one. Pastor! Pastor! This is what we think. I don't care. I really don't. I care about the hurt. I care about the pain. I don't, what, what I don't is, I don't care about the outcome because that's not mine to care about. God's going to be up to, that outcome is up, is up to him. And I'm telling you, when you learn how to play for an audience of one, that's when you begin to please God. Let me tell you this. It's impossible to please God while living to appease people. It is impossible to please God while living to appease people. I'm telling y'all, this, that's all I got in my drawer, y'all. That's it. That's it. That's what I got in my drawer. Oh, I feel good. And I just decided that there's nothing better than Jesus. There's nothing, I, 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 like if he's going to turn this grave into a garden, he's the only one that can do that. So your natural opinion, I'm not going to forsake his supernatural opportunity for your natural opinion. I'm not. This is what God's called me to do. Well, pastor, you should hear the, the comments sometimes. Well, Well, did God tell you that? I don't know because you keep talking. Maybe if you calm down your opinion, you'll hear the voice of God too. Here's the thing. When it's all said and done, my well done is not coming from what's horizontal. My well done is coming from what's vertical. And I want God to say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Not well done, thy good and faithful appeaser. Stand with me. How many of y'all were blessed by this message today? How many of y'all were convicted just a little bit in some points? Come on, raise your hand. It's like, oh, that one kind of hurt. Come on, keep those hands up and act of surrender right now. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray as we surrender to you vertically. That we would follow you horizontally. Father, we repent of our mindsets, of our opinions of thinking that our drawer is the only drawer of a dreamer. Father, I pray, God, that everyone yield to the God dream that you place in their hearts. Now, what I want you to do now is just take your hands and make that cross again. You cannot make a cross without a surrender. You cannot make a cross without a sacrifice. So, Father, right now we sacrifice and we repent. And we lean into your love and your compassion whether you're watching online or watching here on the Zooms. We just say, Father, we are yours and you are mine. And I'm going to follow you for the rest of my days. So if I could give you, like, I love gifts. Y'all can look at me now. And I'm all for Cash App. I'm all for all that. Venmo, I got all that. If you need, if you DM me, I'll let you know. It's my birthday. But if there's something I could give back to you today, it's those 10 things.